mostly static infrastructure. You usually get assigned a set of servers by your operators, and then developers will deal with that. Each server tends to be unique. They have usually very interesting names. You will probably have some sort of heterogeneous fleet. If you create your servers when they happen on demand, then what can happen is that you start with a version of your operating system, then the next version uh, is released, the new servers will contain the new version, and then after a while you will end up with a, a very diverse set of systems. We have issues with uh, configuration drift uh, after many upgrades and installing patches and patches and patches on systems, then the configurations tend to be changing a lot. You will have probably uh, hard to reproduce environments. You have issues in staging or production, and sometimes it's quite hard to figure out what is going on in the servers. And lastly, um, failure events tend to be quite costly. Each server is really important for you, and uh, when one of them goes down, it's usually a fire drill. Does that sound familiar to anybody here? <laughs> OK. So we have an, a new challenge ahead of us. We, uh, we're going to need new tools. And some of them will exist, and some may not. We have to develop ourselves to overcome all of this and implement immutable infrastructures. Uh, automation becomes a necessity. Many things that you can get away doing manually when you have a mostly static environment, if you're moving to the cloud, think a different, more dynamic environment, then these things become a necessity. And your applications will have to change. And this is uh, quite an important topic. So let's talk about it. So what about the application architectures? So there is this uh, manifesto. It's called the 12-factor application. I highly recommend it. It provides us. It started uh, many years ago as a guidelines to build a software as a service kind of uh, platforms, but it has tremendously good ideas to work on the cloud. Yeah, I won't go over all of the 12 points, but I encourage you to uh, look, uh, look it up afterwards. So the first thing that I want to mention, and I think is one of the most important, is about configuration. So configuration is everything that is likely to change between deployments. When we're having immutable infrastructures, we basically have very uh, uh, one set of code. And this code will be deployed on all your environments. And then you have to make sure that all your configuration is, is the only thing that will change from pre-production to production to testing, etc. So separate your configuration from your code storing uh, URLs, passwords, etc., in your GitHub. That's not uh, a good way to do. So w we want to store it in the environment, and there are many ways that you can do this. And use environment variables. Environment variables are a very simple mechanism to pass information to uh, different processes. They work across languages. You can use them in Bash, Python, Ruby, C, whatever you like. And this simplicity. It's what allows us to have a great flexibility. So now let's talk about the processes, right? So in an immutable infrastructure uh, type of architecture, you will have a stateless process uh, that share nothing. So basically, no persistent data between requests. Uh, if you have kind of a dependency, so only a server can request uh, can serve subsequent requests from the same user. That's usually an anti-pattern. It prevents us from scaling horizontally. So that's something that needs to be fixed. And the file system must be used just as a brief cache. So if you have a user that is uploading images, then it's fine. You can store it on disk while the process is being requested. But then you have to ship it somewhere else to serve uh, after that request is done. Disposability. Processes are disposable. We have to think that uh, processes will be able to die at any point. So we should handle graceful failures. We want to perform maintenances. We want to take services offline. And then we should have mechanisms to uh, send a shut down signals to our processes. But at the same time, we have to be aware that things can fail at any time. And our processes should be able to recover 
from a, a unexpected crash without a human intervention. Okay. So in the 12 factor up uh, manifesto, they talk about um, the build release run process, right? So there's, there's a sample picture here. It's not uh, too complicated. Basically, we're going to take our code from uh, GitHub or uh, any kind of version control system. We're going to bundle with all the dependencies that you have. So mostly applications will have some package manager that is dependent on the language, and then you will also depend on system libraries. We will take all of these together, and we will create a unified bundle. Then the product of that, we're going to combine it with the configuration that we get from uh, our systems. And then you basically have an application, and then it's ready to be started, and you can start the processes and start serving and attending requests. This is just a small picture of uh, our basic pipelines at Shipstead. Basically, we have our code stored in GitHub Enterprise. Every time a developer makes a push to a branch or to master, uh, a, a pipeline will be triggered in Travis. It will run the tests. The, after the tests are successful, we will create an artifact. An artifact is usually an RPM or a Debian package. We're going to push that to our artifactory repository. After this is completed, Spinnaker, either automatically or manually, will create a pipeline. So what, the, what this will do, uh, underneath it uses a Packer, which is a, a tool to allow us to create different formats of images. And so in our case, we will either create a Docker container or an Amazon AMI. And then this will be deployed. In the case of Docker, we have uh, Kubernetes clusters on the cloud, but we also have Kubernetes clusters on the data centers. And in the case of uh, virtual images, then we'll just launch new instances on AWS. For the process of releasing code and managing configuration, uh, when we started uh, at Shipstead, basically DynamoDB was the, the tool of choice just because it's available there. And KMS is a service from Amazon to um, cipher uh, uh, things. And then they, we also have a tool which is called uh, Strongbox, which is open source. You can find it on GitHub. And basically, it combines the two things, uh, plus a bunch of other features regarding versioning of the credentials, etc. And it also offers integration if you're in Java environments, then it can uh, fetch the, the environment variables from the DynamoDB tables and the secrets, and it does so transparently. Then we have the deployment strategies. Basically, when we're making changes and we want to deploy them, we have basically three strategies. So the first one is just a rolling terminate. You kill an instance, launch a new instance. When that is done, kill another instance, launch a new one, and so, for, so on and so forth. Then we have blue-green deployments, which is basically if you have 10 servers taking the request, you will spawn 10 new servers, put them in the load balancer when that is all healthy, take them down from the, take the old uh, server group from the load balancer, and kill them eventually. And then a canary release is basically doing a blue-green deployment, but you do it progressively. So you will start with one server, monitor it, keep an eye on it. Then you will start increasing the amount of servers, taking on and more traffic, and then eventually killing uh, all the old servers. So now, stateful services. This is the part where I, why I'm here in this conference. Um, so I want to give you a bit of context of what I'm doing at work. Here's a colleague of mine, Victor, there. Uh, we're a very small team. We're just five engineers plus one manager. And we have around 30 clusters in production. We're managing uh, like 100 servers, more or less. Uh, so this is a lot of work for such a small team. We have many internal customers and large amounts of data. So the reality is that you may have all your microservices uh, and APIs, etc., but you will need data, and that data has to live somewhere. So it will either, either live in a file system or in a database of some kind. SQL databases, NoSQL databases, graph databases, 
you name it. So everybody needs a database. So can we talk about immutable databases? Well, kind of, right? I mean, we're going to have to store the state, but we're going to treat the system like you have no state. Any node can die at any time, and the system should still be OK. We're going to embrace distributed systems. We have all these databases, distributed databases, that we offer, making guarantees about durability of your data, that your nodes can die, and then you should be OK. You still have availability. And so we're going to uh, take advantage of that for our uh, release processes. Okay, so this is what I call control chaos through uh, continuous deployment. Basically, what we're trying to do in our team is bring continuous deployment practices from web applications in general and try to apply this to the world of databases. Okay, this is a question I get a lot from uh, people, uh, usually some friends, and they say, well, you guys are crazy, isn't that dangerous? Right? The reality is, if we cannot kill a node when we want, so we are going to schedule a downtime process, and we cannot kill a node, then when it fails for unexpected reasons, then we're going to be in real trouble. So what we want to do is continuously exercise the, the failures of the system, but at the same time, do it in a way that we can control. And so if there is any problem, that we can fix it quickly before it becomes an incident. So we'll talk, tell you now how we do uh, the process of creating a new cluster. Okay? So a node life cycle usually starts like this. All the images will launch from, so all the servers will launch from the same image, right? The first thing they will do is try to load the configuration from the environment. They will generate the appropriate configuration files for the databases and all the different processes that will be running. It will ask information about the cluster uh, from the cloud uh, provider. If it's the first node of a cluster, then it will have to do the process of bootstrapping a cluster. And then when you launch another kind of uh, another type new uh, server, it will either have to figure out, OK, will I join uh, an existing cluster and just add more capacity? Or if, on the contrary, I'm replacing a node that has been decommissioned. And then finally, they will respond to a kind of health check so that uh, indicate it will indicate success of the process. In the case of Cassandra, we started using uh, Priam from Netflix. Um, we had lots of trouble uh, with it. It was uh, not keeping up to date with the versions of Cassandra that we needed. We were not feeling comfortable approaching the code. It's quite complex. And so there was a project started in the company. And we developed an in-house solution. It's around 300, 5,000 lines of Python code, and then like 500 lines of uh, scripting in Bash. It's called Neoptolemus. And I will show you a little bit of code from it. Um, so this is just uh, some code extracts from the project. Basically, when you start a new Cassandra node, first thing it does, it will try to create a RAID. It will try to find the seeds from the, from the cluster. It will generate all the configurations. Right? Um, in this case, it will try to find if there is an, an IP that it's trying to replace. Basically, in this case, it will try to find all the nodes in the cluster. If there is any node that is marked as down on the AWS API, then it knows that it's meant to be replaced. If there are no dead nodes, then it means, OK, you're trying to increase capacity. Very simple, uh, but not so easy to figure out at the beginning. Then in the case for Zookeeper, this is usually quite a lot of people ask me about Zookeeper because Zookeeper has the particularity that all the nodes need to know the IPs of all the other nodes. So we, uh, one, one of our colleagues from the team, he came up with this really good solution. Basically, what we do is we will create, um, so if we ha say we want three nodes, what we will do is we will create three network interfaces. These network interfaces have the ID of the, of the node the, and some information about its role. And then what happens is that when you launch a new node, basically it will look for a, 
all the network interfaces that will have these tags. When it finds one that is not uh, being in use, tries to attach it for itself. And then from the information that is stored on the network interface, it will try to get, for instance, uh, the ID of the node and then the role of the node. Okay? It's, it's true that we cannot add extra capacity easily in this way, but the reality is that we are not out trying to auto scale um, Zookeeper. And so we now have a much simpler system than the, what we had before, which was also using another Netflix product called Exhibitor. Um, so we are not using that anymore. And with a very simple uh, a script, we are able to figure out all the information that is necessary to form part of the cluster for Zookeeper. So what about deploying changes? Okay. So the first step when we want to deploy changes is to roll out uh, the infrastructure. We use uh, CloudFormation for this purpose. We will create all the resources that are necessary, uh, buckets in S3, security groups, etc. And we use a, a Python tool called Septra that will drive the whole process of creating the, the stacks. Okay, and then comes the interesting part. We have to actually uh, roll out the update and kill the nodes. Right? So for this, we have a bunch of scripts that were written, hard to maintain, and so we decided to tackle it, and we written a small framework that is called, that well, has a funny name and I cannot say it, <laughs> but it currently supports uh, Cassandra, Kafka, and Zookeeper. And I'll show you a bit how we do it. Okay? And the first thing that this does is it has two concepts. Okay? It, you have the cluster, and then a cluster is composed of nodes. And you have health checks at both levels. So you may have checks at the node level, and then you also have checks at the cluster level. It could happen that all the nodes are healthy, but still the cluster is not healthy. And it could happen that the cluster itself is healthy, but not all the nodes are healthy. And this uh, becomes relevant when we want to actually be killing nodes. We want to be safe when we do it. And it implements the updating algorithms. So when we actually say, let's kill a node, right? the well, first thing is we'll send a shutdown signal. We will wait for the cleanup. Uh, this will vary for Cassandra. It's a bit different than from Kafka, than from Zookeeper. And then we will wait for a new node to spawn. And once the new node has started and the cluster has recovered, then we can proceed with the next nodes. OK? So this is, this is not pseudocode. This is the actual uh, main code of the function. OK? So we take a list of the nodes. We check which of these nodes actually need to be upgraded. We will wait for uh, the whole cluster to be healthy. And once it's healthy, we will proceed with the termination. Once that's done, go with the next node, go with the next node. And finally, wait for the whole cluster to be healthy again, and then finish the process. OK? This is uh, a brief example of what a node object would look like. Basically, you, it receives an instance ID uh, from AWS. And the basic, basic, basic check is if the node is running, then it's healthy. Mm. Nothing else. Now for the cluster, we have the method to wait until it's healthy. Basically, we will wait until we have matched the auto scaling group capacity. So if we say we want three nodes, it will be healthy when we actually have three nodes. And those three nodes have to be healthy. And the cluster also has to be he healthy. This is the base class where all the other ones will inherit from. And then the basic check, OK, it's, it's healthy uh, if all the nodes are healthy. Okay. Now let's just, I will mention briefly about Cassandra and some of the specifics that it has as a database. When we say that we want to terminate uh, a Cassandra node, to do this cleanly, the first thing is we will dis disable binary, so we are not taking any more connections from the, from the clients. We will wait for all the hint deliveries. Um, Cassandra has a mechanism where if a node is unavailable, it will, other nodes will accept the writes, and then when it's back up, it will uh, deliver those hints to maintain the consistency. And so we want to wait for all the hints for other nodes to be delivered before killing it. 
And then we're going to drain the node, which is basically means flushing all uh, data to disk. We will make a backup, terminate the instance, and that's it. And then for implementing the health checks, uh, a node will be healthy if it's running, of course. If they, we have some limits that we want to be careful regarding this usage, um, we want to make sure that we don't have any hints, that we don't have any uh, compactions uh, to be pending, and that the service itself uh, is up. Okay. And for the Cassandra cluster, we issue a command that is run on all the machines, which basically will say how many nodes are in the up and normal state. We have to do this on every node because there could be discrepancies. So if you ask only one node, it could tell you that everything is okay, but other nodes may not agree. So we have to make sure that all the nodes will agree on the state. If I have a desired capacity of uh, six nodes, then if all six nodes report that six nodes are up and running and normal, then we can proceed uh, with the rollout. Okay. For Kafka, we do a bit differently. Uh, we will query an endpoint on the on the server if the endpoint is uh, responding so if, if the endpoint on the node is responding correctly then this means that the node is healthy and for the cluster we will do something similar we the, we have an http endpoint we ask for the health information if there is an agreement between all of the nodes that the status is green then uh, it means that the cluster is healthy Okay. So now I will mention briefly some of our tools that we are using. Okay. The first thing I'm going to say if you're working on the cloud is just embrace your cloud provider. Um, there's always the discussion between having vendor locking or not, but the reality for us is that we are very committed to the AWS platform, and so we decided that we are going to invest heavily and try to use as most services that are useful for us, and uh, basically that's why we're paying the Amazon price. Okay, so some examples of the things we're using. We're using CloudFormation, which is uh, to keep a infrastructure as code. We use the Systems Manager, which is a uh, not so well-known part of the EC2, but it offers lots of things for management, especially useful is an agent that runs on every machine and you can send commands to it. So we use it heavily for maintenance operations and also to gather information from the machines. It's much easier than having to deal with SSH into going all the machines so you can just yeah, use the system manager. You can query the commands, it will handle failures, etc. and you will get the output of the system. You get the logs of the standard output, standard error, etc. It's really nice uh, and we're very happy that we use it. We use DynamoDB to store configuration uh, for the different clusters. We are using KMS for secrets. We rely heavily also on the EC2 API to gather information from the clusters. We will have instance tags. We will have tags on the network interfaces. And basically, we rely heavily on tags. And then we use S3 mostly for archival purposes of our backups. Okay, so now uh, preparing for disaster. We all know about databases. We don't want to be losing all of that. So when we decided that we were going to tackle this and we we're going to start working with um, continuous deployment, the first thing that came was what if this goes wrong? Uh, we have to be prepared. And so for this, we have developed uh, a new tool it's going to be open source quite soon. We're just uh, doing the final touches on that for Cassandra backups. Um, why did we decide to implement our own tool? Well, we were using some other tools before, and what happened is that they were not very space efficient, so we were storing a lot of data. Uh, when we have several hundred terabytes in S3, then this thing starts actually costing a lot of money, and most of the files were actually duplicates and so our new system basically take us, takes advantage of Cassandra, the fact that the um, SS tables are immutable and then we don't have to duplicate them, we just upload them 
uh, once and then don't touch it again. So, brief summary of what I've just said. What some of the advantages of if you work with immutable infrastructure, we have a known state and less deployment failures. This is because uh, testing our infrastructure in isolation is possible. We know that when we perform acceptance tests, load tests in our staging environment, this exact same code will be the one used in production. So we can take a production cluster, we can take the <coughs> configuration parameters and have an exact replica in testing. We can tune things and then when we roll out to production, it's gonna be exactly the same. It's not gonna be any change of a last minute package update that may break certain things. We're certain that it's the exact same code that we want to deploy. And this consistency leads us to have more trust in the system and also in the case that there is, an a pro there is a problem, it's very easy to roll back because we will take the exact same image that we were using before and put it back in place. Of course, there are trade-offs and this is, doesn't come for free. Uh, you have to do a high investing in inve investment into the automation, okay? So you have to consider that. Um, and rolling an update, of a whole cluster takes time. As Victor has been dealing with this last week, uh, we can, some nodes will take maybe 12, 15, 20 hours to recover. Uh, we know this is a long time. We are trying to work on this. Some ideas that we have is uh, using reattachable EBS volumes. So basically, w you have a node and before killing it, you will detach the hard disk. When a new node spans, we'll find the, the, uh, the corresponding disk and attach it itself. This works great for certain workloads, but we have uh, certain clusters where they depend on the physical instance store. In the case of Amazon, when the machine is shut down, that disappears. So we still have to find a solution. We're considering perhaps using uh, Docker containers inside of the virtual machines. Although also that has some problems in our environment because where the Docker registry is, it's not open to any other network just at the moment when you build the images. So we, there are some struggles. We, we're still trying to find uh, solutions for it, but uh, we're very happy with this. And so even if these things take a long time, we're now in a better position than we were before, at least just because the whole process is now automated and you don't have to go through a playbook with uh, 10 pages to explain how to do um, a rolling update of uh, Cassandra, for instance. Okay, so if you want to take away something from this talk uh, with yourself, uh, I just want to tell you that immutable infrastructure is a means to an end and it's not a goal. Uh, we're doing this because we think it's a better way of working and, it, and it's helping us. Uh, we're not doing it just for the sake of doing it. This is not about establishing religious arguments or being right or wrong. It's just about choosing the right tool for the job and we feel like in our context, it's the right choice. It, um, this is not about tools, it's about the idea. So just because we're using AWS and a bunch of AWS services, it doesn't mean that if you're working on premise or if you're working on Google Cloud, that you cannot uh, take these ideas with you. You can implement it gradually. You don't have to change all your application architecture in one go. If you look at the 12 factor manifesto, uh, there are 12 points. Even if you start applying one, two, or three of them to your applications, you will be in a much better place and then you can start adopting these practices uh, slowly. And then finally, this may not be a good fit for you. Uh, we are managing a lot of clusters for many clients. If you just have one cluster uh, and you have a really small company, this may be a overkill for you. And there, there are other solutions where you can achieve a similar goals that may be more appropriate. So take that into account and do your own research. Thank you very much. My name is Jorge Diaz and I'm happy to be here. <laughs>